Harvard Divinity School. The Troubled Every Day in of Gaza, Restoring Agency and Creative Possibility, March 8th, 2022. Welcome everyone to our third event in our spring semester series, Disrupting Injustice and Promoting Moral Imagination in Israel-Palestine. My name is Hilary Rantisi and I am the Associate Director of the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, a program of religion and public life at Harvard Divinity School. Our work centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence and power, and examines how a more capacious understanding of a religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for just peace building. The primary case study we're focusing on is on Israel-Palestine. Our aim is to stretch the scholarly discourse around religion and the practices of peace building and examine the decolonial potentialities of art, religion, and identity transformation. Our series this semester showcases religion, conflict, and peace fellows and their work. While, affiliate, while affiliated with our program, they have all worked on a variety of projects from illuminating transnational solidarities to reimagining Jewish identity, supporting Palestinian steadfastness, smooth and cultivating moral imagination and creative possibilities for a just peace in Israel-Palestine. Today's event highlights the work of our fellow Salem al qudwa who will be presenting on the troubled every day in of Gaza, restoring agency and creative possibility. Salem al qudwa is a Palestinian architect from Gaza, currently a fellow with our program at Harvard. And while he has been with us, he's been developing a model for reconstruction in conflict areas. He's particularly, particularly interested in the possibilities of architecture for social change and the participation of affected people. He has extensive living experience in Gaza City. Um, we were hoping that uh, Dr. Sarah Roy would also be joining us. Um, uh, unfortunately, she won't be uh, able to join us today, but she has shared some remarks that I will be um, uh, sharing after the presentation. Uh, Dr. Sarah Roy is an affiliate um, of our program and a senior research scholar at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. The um, uh, Center is Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard is also co-sponsoring this event, and we thank them for that. So without further ado, um, I invite Salem al qudwa to uh, transport us to Gaza with his presentation. Thank you, Salem, for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you and learning from you. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Divinity School for hosting um, uh, inviting me to give this talk and also for the Center for the Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University for co-sponsoring uh, my talk. I would like also to thank uh, all of you, Professor Diana Moore, Hilary Rantisi, Atalia Omar, for all the support that they have been giving since the last two years, and Dream Atasi and Mavi for all the technical support. And also I would like to thank my colleagues, the fellows from the Divinity School who joined us right now from my colleagues and friends from the Graduate School of Design and my friends from all over the world who joined uh, this event. Uh, I will briefly talk about uh, uh, the background and uh, the, the, the uh, ongoing conflict right now in Gaza, just to bring the attention about what's going on and the existing situation in relation to the troubled every day in of Gaza while trying to restore agency and creative possibility. I would like to share the screen I would like to start uh, my presentation with sharing this urgent call uh, that I kept hearing from wounded women while doing extensive field work in Gaza between 2018 and 2019. The wounded woman told me that I dream to see a concrete star over my head before I die. In Arabic, أنا بحلم إنه يكون في عندي بلاطة خرسانية فوق راسي قبل ما أموت. It's an urgent need where thousands of low-income households and vulnerable families' homes headed by wounded women in the Gaza Strip are waiting to receive 
a flat concrete slab on the top of their existing houses to accommodate further rooms and rooftop terraces. These concrete slabs would serve as incremental construct constructions to host the natural growth of the population, to avoid overcrowding spaces, and to provide thermal comfort inside the living spaces according to the minimum standards. Gaza nowadays, the Gaza Strip, which is under siege since the last 15 years, is almost 365 square kilometers in size, roughly a quarter of the size of London in the UK, which is now a home to almost 2 million people. The Gaza Strip is unique in being an area under siege and occupation for over 70 years, and there is no other area of the world that was so oppressed for so long. What happens to a place and a people who have been placed under siege for so long? During the 2014 assaults, the Israeli forces instructed the population of Gaza to evacuate a three kilometer wide zone. This area was subject to bombardment and then land forces caused further destruction of houses and property. Internal migration occurred within the Gaza Strip from hazardous and exposed border areas to Gaza City itself, causing a significant increase in land prices and housing needs in a situation where available resources were limited. In 2021, the assaults on the Gaza Strip that lasted for 11 days, Amira Haas wrote in Haas newspaper that Israel is wiping out entire Palestinian families on purpose. As you could see, in Gaza, it's the idea of architecture as destructive, a machine to kill, where concrete slabs and columns are smashing the human bodies and rubble and shrapnel killing people. Architecture is becoming to be the graveyard of the inhabitants, the site of memory, and something much more absolute. The unstable economic situation, the shortage of construction material due to the complicated Gaza reconstruction mechanism, the frequent attacks and military operations on the Gaza Strip, the lack of electricity, which is below to the minimum standards, often forces families to build back lower quality homes. As Sarah Roy mentioned in one of her books, the Gaza Strip, the political economy of de development, she mentioned, I will start her quote, Gazans have always been extremely hardworking people. They want nothing more than to work, earn a living, and provide for their families. They have been denied this right, and it's a human right, by Israel, the United States, the EU, and other donor nations supporting Israel's blockade, which has ruined the Palestinian economy. Instead, Gazans have been forced into dependency on foreign assistance, which is an obscenity. In the restriction that have undermined the economy, allow people to produce and trade, return to them their economic and human rights, and no one will ask for anything. My research questions could be summarized as follows. Given the extensive constraints, what's my role and what's my social responsibility being an architect or a reconstruction architect trying to help my communities back there? What about the results on buildings and how per permanent they should be? And given the lack of access to building materials, what is the appropriate type of construction without falling into the mud house, a tent, or a container trap? As you could see in this slide, each and every two or three years, and after having attacks from the Israelis on the gas strip, we do have this kind of experimental uh, technology implemented on my people over there. Such architectural ad hoc, ad hoc projects that are intended as prototype generally demonstrated a limited understanding of the morphology and the spatial formation of how people live in Gaza. The combination of Israeli military events and the construction of temporary makeshift shelters have resulted in substantial demographic and social changes, especially for low income extended families. As you could see, the mud house the sandbag shelters and the wooden shelters, which has been implemented with those international NGOs with good intention. 
Gazans in general are not used to building and living in such mud houses because of the high cost and shortage of land in Gaza. Large families live in a multi-floor complete buildings that house the grandparents, children, and married sons and their families. One of the households from one of the wooden transitional house projects has said, a wooden house is better than living in a tent. I live with my wife, my two daughters, and two of my unmarried sons. My other three sons rented homes to live in with their wives. As you could see in this section to the left, the drawing to the left, the social infrastructure spatial diagram, which illustrates how different sections of a Palestinian extended family live together at a typical urban residential unit in Gaza. The house is shared by several generations of a family where the elderly parents occupy the ground floor, which is easier for them to access and to move in and out to receive guests. The first and the second floor are shared by their married sons and their wives and children. On the uppermost level, the columns are left bare in expectation of a future generation that can add more floors if needed. The roof is a shared space between the generations for different activities. As you could see over here, putting the two images together, when the Israelis are destroying the physical fabric of this extended family, they are not only destroying the building itself, they are also destroying the social structure and the social fabric. And when the international NGOs are coming to replace this concrete extended family structure with a mud house or with a wooden shelter, it's also producing another layer of urban violence within the Gaza Strip. It's also the theme of care and the role of intimate elder care in our everyday lives. The importance of the extended family and how a son can never repay the debt he owes to his parents. It would be a debt he carries for the rest of his life. A person's duty towards his parents comes second only to his duty towards God. Quran says in Surah Al-Isra, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما The translation is You should not worship anyone but him alone Treat your parents with a great kindness If either or both of them attained old age Why with you? Do not even say off to them nor rebuke them but speak to them kind words. I think the key word over here is عندكَ. While being with you. As I lived for a couple of years in Oxford, England, while doing my PhD, and being a resident in the United States since the last two years, when I arrived with my family on January 2020, And as we were going through the second lockdown here in the United States, I was a bit worried about nursing and all residential and all people's residential homes. It turned out to be the worst managed part of the current crisis and which were the most awful symptoms of the infection, especially in the first wave when patients were sent from hospitals to completely unprepared residential care homes where the virus spread with no control. All the attention has been on hospitals and little, little thought has been given to protection of all the residents and stuff from spreading the infection. And the residents who are well not able to see, who are well, we are not able to see anyone, no activities and no visitors. For example, in New York and Washington state, nursing homes were the first hotspot of mass casualty casualty back in March of 2020 that the U.S. saw as a warning, warning for the rest of the country. Pushing the old away from the family not, not only hurts the very idea of family, but decrease and cut the smooth transition of wisdom to the next generation. What's the relation of this thing to Gaza and how Gaza, Gaza could be a unique listen to the rest of the world? The good news that we have from some 
centers doing some research about housing in Canada and the US that related to housing that millions of young people nowadays in Canada and the US between the age of 23 and 38 got back to live with their parents. For some of them, it was a choice, but for most of them, it was a must simply because of the economic situation and simply because they could not offer to pay the rent of their houses. So we are in the midst of a global crisis of care. As architect Christopher Day once said in his well-known book, Places of the Soul, that architects tend to think that architecture matters, but actually it's what goes on inside them that matters. And I'm really more interested in what's going on inside, uh, inside the housing unit. For example, in urban areas, the extended family pattern is a strong and a variety of older relatives, especially mothers-in-law and uncles, exert control over the woman in the household's life. Their influence is often stronger than that of the husband and his, and this has created tension and conflict between female members of the family. For example, mothers-in-law, sisters-in-law, and daughters-in-law. Some, some young married women put their personal security at stake and may get in conflict with family members to preserve their autonomy and live in a separate house while still respecting their husband's responsibilities toward extended family. While interviewing a couple of foreigners who have been living in Gaza since the last 30 years, I have met three females from Russia, Ukraine, and Croatia, respectively, and who have been living in Gaza with their Palestinian husbands for the past 20 years. They pointed out this influence, and one woman confirmed these feelings by saying that I enjoyed tremendously the sense of belonging through my in-laws in Gaza. One never feels anonymous here, and for many, this can bother some. I have enjoyed it. And to my surprise, when I asked them if they prefer to go back, they said that they confirmed that, that they would like to stay and to raise their children over there in Gaza. As you could see, Russian women and Ukrainian are living side by side in Gaza in peace and harmony. The impact of the social tension or a sense of belonging in relation to the built environment may have enduring consequences for the whole family as well. To inhabit homes in Gaza is to appropriate domestic spaces while falling in between the Israeli constraints, constraining powers and the social cultural forces of appropriation. I did extensive field work between 2018 and 2019 in the whole Gaza Strip when I was the shelter program manager working with one of the NGOs and while preparing to defend my PhD back in Oxford. And I got back to work with communities and with families in need in those rural and marginalized areas, which has been hit badly during the 2014 assaults on the Gaza Strip. The ethnographic approach of architecture has been used and it enabled me as a researcher and as a practitioner to access and to interact with local communities and to observe how they go about their everyday lives and learn more about their concerns and perception about their life over there. It also allowed me to do some physical mapping and social mapping and to trace the natural growth and the expansion of extended families and this kind of dramatic change from horizontal expansion to vertical expansion for the first time that had been noticed in rural and agricultural areas, simply because land is shrinking and the population and the natural growth is increasing. In the process, I, I identified a need for further research on a specific group, young women who have been widowed in the ongoing conflict in the Gaza Strip and who now dwell with their children in the extended family house of their late husbands. I was, I was also interested in mapping the movement restrictions of the woman and young widowed women mainly, and due to the traditions and cultural constraints in Gaza, young widows may be obliged to marry their brothers-in-law to keep the children within the husband's family and to protect them. 
right now, um, focusing on developing more design items and more design components in relation to the space, the everyday space and the domestic violence, where my fellowship project is to illustrate how these women adapt to their new situation within their in-laws families' houses and how this difficult situation reshapes the contours of everyday architectural design when it comes to privacy and long-term security for women and for their children as well. In addition to that, I also keep the focus on translating some social and physical map mapping uh, issues in order to reach uh, a specific design components related to my current project. For example, bread making, which is like saving a lot of money for families in need, and at the same time, getting cement through cement vouchers and baking cements outside. I was trying to link both components together in order to reach a design component. At, it will be illustrated in the next slide. As you can see over here, the area that had been calculated and needed for a wounded woman or for a woman to help her extended family that to prepare bread for one complete week. So what I'm trying over here to do is just to link those things together. In addition to privacy and hygiene issues, environmental control is a major unmet need with poor ventilation and minimal insulation contributing to unhealthy temperature conditions through much of the year in the Gaza Strip, Palestine. Right now, I'm working on micro design elements in relation to the openings, the width of the openings, the heights of the openings, and how they could be insulated, and also to protect the woman and their privacy inside their, their houses as well. And the most important thing, which is in addition to the lack of access to loans or microfinance projects, with us supporting large families in Gaza, faces many challenges, actually. Most of the widows are relying on humanitarian assistance as a primary form of support. Outside such assistance, one of the main ways that widows try to earn a living is by running informal businesses. As you could see in this imaginary image uh, below, I'm trying to adapt these kinds of uh, flexible uh, spaces where we do have a semi-open space at the entrance that could be shared by family members of the extended family and which could be transferred easily to be a small grocery shop for the wounded woman and her children that they could sell some bakery and cookies and to support themselves as well. So what I'm trying to do right now in relation to the, to the, to the design component, I'm trying to understand this kind of limitations on their daily life and how it could be utilized to form a, a more uh, imaginative and more uh, functional spaces for the wounded women who have been uh, lived with their extended families as well. The goal of my project is to confront conventional attitudes towards residential reconstruction in Gaza with a view to creating a nurturing and safe environment for women and children, removing themselves from dangerous conflict situations as well as from for community empowerment. So the sense of the families, the mothers, the single mothers and their children becoming involved with the wars in, prog in progress to their homes is a great intensive for community building and self work. The outcomes of my current fellowship with the Harvard Divinity School is two things that I'm working on right now. In addition to the design components that I shared with you so far, I'm working on publishing a paper with the title, The Troubled Everyday in of Gaza Restoring Agency and Creative Possibility. And also, in addition to that, trying to draft a policy paper with the title, Social Changes, Home Appropriation and Housing Rights for Rooted Women in Gaza, drawing on my proposed case study of Gaza, I'm elaborating design components that embrace, embrace possibilities for sustaining women's housing rights in a different uh, future. And I think the second component, which is the policy paper is going to take more time because I realize that it's not only a cultural issue actually, which is related to Gaza, but I'm trying to bridge the gap between those cultural issues, the design components, 
the housing rights and the legal issues at work. I'm also pleased to share with you some good news that part of my research, which was a, a, a research article that was edited by Dr. Sarah Roy, and I'd like to thank her for her val valuable time editing my research article with the title, Ethical Implications of Experimental Design on Affected Communities in the Gaza Strip. That research article was recently shortlisted for the Royal Institute of British, article, British Architects uh, President Research Award for the year 2021. What I'm trying to do over here is to communicate and externalize the design knowledge and thoughts about social engagement and also to theorize part of my practical experience being an architect and a reconstruction emergency coordinator uh, in the Gaza Strip for the last 15 years. And also to give a credit to the voices and also to give a credit to the communities that I work with and learn from them so many things and to share their voices, their aspiration for a better future. Although the focus of my research is on Gaza, but its finding will benefit reconstruction efforts and other conflict zones in the Middle East and Muslim countries as well, where a human displacement is a defining problem and the post-conflict reconstruction of the built environment is an urgent need. For many, Gaza is considered to be a piece of hell, for me at least, and for my population over there. Gaza has been made into hell, but my mother country, her people, all hell living creatures and the vegetations and earth are not hell. Looking forward to see you soon in Gaza and to see you soon in Palestine. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Salem, for transporting us to Gaza and for um, this amazing presentation. Um, we often only hear about Gaza, uh, the siege, which is important to recognize also the context uh, under which you're describing all of this. And you also talked about this, but people continue to live there. And it's important to talk about the everyday life and how people live. So thank you for this. Um, in the next few minutes, I will be sharing the brief comments from Dr. Sh uh, Sarah Roy, and um, we will have an opportunity for more uh, discussion and questions after that. So here is what Dr. Sh Roy shared. I first met Salem several years ago through a mutual friend and colleague in Gaza. Salem was then conducting field work for his doctoral dissertation on indigenous architecture in Gaza, on the way local and typically vulnerable Gazans design, organize, and use space that is not only utilitarian and livable, but aesthetic. Salem was also engaged in a project to rehabilitate Gaza's long shuttered cinemas, buildings, with great architectural value and beauty, but in varying states of disrepair and decay. His hope was not only to restore these wonderful examples of indigenous architecture, but to reopen them to the public, revitalizing the role of theater, once quite present in, in Gaza's cultural life. Salem is, in the truest sense of the term, a cultural activist. He's an extremely talented and creative architect, an architectural en engineer who not only thinks outside the box, but he also thinks without a box. While I do not possess any professional expertise in architecture, I have read Salem's writings and have spent time with him walking the streets of Gaza. He taught me to view local architecture, simple minimalist houses and gardens in an entirely different way. He taught me to see the ordinary as extraordinary, not as an expression of limited thinking, bleakness or despondency, but of resourcefulness and beauty, even poetry. What appears as an uninspiring gray concrete box-like structure is actually informed by and itself supports and facilitates a complex network of human interactions, 
Seen in this way, the concept of place and home and the possibilities to which they give rise assume an entirely new meaning and role. By recasting how one interprets Gaza's built environment, Salem not only challenges conventional understandings, but focuses on the agency of the people who inhabit the home, who inhabit the home they have designed and built. This agency is the informing cornerstone of his work and speaks to the importance of the ordinary and simple in the lives of people living in a state of ongoing conflict. Agency and capacity have always existed in great abundance among Gazans and are critical factors in community rehabilitation. Yet the many foreign organizations providing humanitarian and so-called development assistance to Gaza have seldom acknowledged, let alone meaningfully engaged Palestinians as actors in defining and designing their present and future in any domain, be it political, economic, or architectural. Palestinian development has never really been a Palestinian project, but an Israeli and American one, reflecting only the interests and priorities of the latter. Salem's research directly challenges this through his scholarship and practical work. I would also add the following observations from an earlier writing based on my trip to Gaza in 2016 when I first met Salem, which painfully still apply. Perhaps the most striking feature of life in Gaza is attenuation, a narrowing of space and the certainty of that space as a place to live and a narrowing of desire, expectation, and vision. Given the immense difficulties of everyday life, the particular and the mundane, having enough food, clothing, or electricity have been elevated to an aspiration. Concerns are inward looking and confined and focused, understandably on self and inward and on self and family. When a family of mine asked some of his students, what is your wish? They answered, a new pair of trousers, a new shirt, and ice cream. The craving is not for a homeland and the fear is not its absence. The craving is for a livelihood, no matter how meager, clean water and sanctuary and the fear is that they have, they are unattainable. Within such incarceration, there's little place for dreams. Why dream when opportunities do not exist and cannot be created? Why plan when there is little, if any possibility of realizing those plans? Why even resist when it is unclear who should be resisted? Who will benefit and what it will achieve? We have no leaders with a national vision and no central authority, an economist friend told me. We need a common agenda, but in Gaza today, that does not exist. We are fragmented, fragmented carved up uh, entity with a variety of internal and external actors, each pursuing their own agenda and using Gaza as a way to promote it. I heard a common lament. We are losing our ability to think speculatively and analytically and the capacity to accurately judge our predicament and how to address it. It is precisely this reality that Salem's work confronts and repairs, and he is not alone in his efforts. Although little visible, Gaza is home to other forms of creative rethinking and rebuilding including a burgeoning of cultural production, art, theater, photography, music. A range of initiatives have emerged over time that attempt in their own way to address Gaza's predicament. Without a guiding and functioning central authority, these efforts are by nature self-contained and confined. Still, they remain vibrant and persistent. They include the renewal of small-scale agriculture, 
human rights monitoring, mental health rehabilitation, environmental repair, and technological innovation, where Gaza's tech-savvy population has for many years been subcontracting for companies in India, Bangladesh, and Israel for Google and Microsoft. The constraining factor in Gaza has never been insufficient talent. The constraining factor, one among many, is how to mobilize the talent and transform it into an agent of change, something Salem's work has succeeded in doing. As such, his research holds promise for other communities ravaged by conflict in their own reconstruction and renewal. So these were the, um, the comments of Dr. Sarah Roy. I want to give uh, Dr. Salem and Pudwa an opportunity to respond or to comment if you would like. So much, uh, Hilary, for reading uh, the comments, and I really wish that if Dr. Sarah Roy would, was with us today, unfortunately. Anyway, so uh, I still remember uh, the last year when I, when Dr. Sarah Roy offered that she could read uh, that research article, which is going to be published soon as a book chapter, actually, in one of her books that she's editing with other editors uh, over here in the States. I told her that Dr. Sarah, this is going to be a technical, actually, research article because I'm theorizing part of the experience and considering one of the projects that I work with uh, uh, back there in Gaza with one of the international communities, with one of the international agencies. It's going to be a technical project. It's a design-based uh, project where it's full of drawings and sections and sketches, etc. But she thankfully offered actually to read to read to read the chapter which is extracted or was extracted from my PhD by design, and uh, she gave me uh, a lot of uh, feedback actually, trying to bridge the gap between uh, being a practitioner and also theorizing part of that experience and to uh, and to give credit to the voices actually of of local communities. So to conclude, I'm not actually in favor of those concrete buildings or those kind of gray boxes in Gaza. But what I'm trying to say over here, over here that it's mainly because of the dire necessity. It's not the choice of my people, actually. They do not have so many things to choose from, uh, similar to other designers or architects. We do have concrete, which is the essential thing. But what I'm trying to say over here is how we could add uh, more to the positive things and to the to the things that have been implemented and 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 shared by the community. So I'm arguing that I have learned so many things, so many design techniques from local communities while working in the grounds, rather than imposing uh, design or technical design issues on them, similar to the transitional shelters implemented by many international agencies with good intention. So the main theme over here is to include the people within the process. To, to, to have good ears and to keep listening and to keep in, engaging them within the process. Thank you. Uh, obviously, it comes through very clearly with what you've shared with us today about the process of inclusion and um, bringing in families into the process of thinking of, of their living space and how they live. Um, as we think of Gaza and we think also of a lot of uh, destruction as well. Um, a lot of what you're looking at is, is reconstruction. I'm wondering if you could share with us um, about um, what you've learned from families who have suffered uh, from their homes being destroyed. I'm sure that you have uh, had the opportunity to speak with many families uh, and especially those who have had their homes destroyed. And I'm wondering if you could share with us some of your learnings from uh, your discussions with these families. Yeah, thank you so much, Hilary, for the uh, good and constructive question, actually. As I shared in my first slide, that call, that urgent call from a wounded woman when she said that, uh, uh, I, I dream to have a concrete stab over the top of my head before I die. She's not thinking actually about herself as a wounded woman actually, but she's thinking about the future of her 
sons and daughters, her sons who reached the age of 30 or 35 and could not get married simply because of overcrowding, where it's a serious issue right now in Gaza. So what those women are looking for is just a concrete slab on the top of their heads in order to uh, participate or to have this kind of incremental housing. So when I work with communities working on many projects in relation to summarization or winterization of, of partially or totally damaged houses, mainly partially damaged houses, you know, most of the NGOs are replacing old corrugated metal sheets or asbestos with the new corrugated sheets with some false ceiling. And of course, it's decreasing actually the thermal, the thermal, uh, uh, it's participating and providing more thermal uh, comfort to the housing units. But what those families are looking for is more concrete and tangible uh, solutions, such as the concrete slab, because by implementing the concrete slab, you are also investing in the housing stock in Gaza. Gaza is a shrinking piece of land. Land is shrinking and the natural population of the people is exceeding 2 million people right now. So we have to think seriously about the future of those low-income communities who could not offer. In addition to that, one of the lessons that I have learned that they are able to participate and they keep like uh, offering their participation and doing some plastering, painting, doing some construction work. And as Sarah Roy mentioned in her book, do not give anything, just allow them to work, to have their dignity, and they will ask for nothing, actually. But becoming more dependent on a humanitarian, humanitarian assistance is what's exactly leading us to the situation. So in terms of construction and reconstruction, for example, I have noticed that many families have used recycled materials such as a crushing like rubbles, for example, and using the crushed rubbles and having some concrete uh, blocks here and there and using them in some like filling uh, some, some walls and uh, filling some, some uh, fences outside their houses. So we do have brilliant people who are hardworking and who are willing to participate in reconstructing their houses, just to give them the chance. Thank you. Um, I have several more questions, but I, I'm feeling pressed to uh, open it up for, for the audience. We have a few questions from them. So yes. I will be sharing uh, some of them, reading them out. And then I might uh, include some of my questions as well. But in the meantime, let me start with the first question from Hubert Murray. Um, and he, he says, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Will your research take you up on one scale to consider the design of the neighborhood or district? Thank you so much, Shiva, for your interesting question. Actually, this is one of the, the, the main issues over here, just to have the balance between keeping the focus on these kinds of micro, 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 small things here and there in relation to the daily activities and the rituals of every day, and also doing this kind of uh, zoom out, trying to see how the, the, the bigger pictures is, is going to take place. and. Uh, Based on your advice last uh, semester and this semester as well, I'm auditing a couple of courses at the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design, trying to learn more about this kind of urban design and urban design issues and how we could make this kind of zoom up. And this is actually one of the main themes of my project, how we could connect things, those fragmented things all together in relation to the cooking, using the mud oven, privacy issues, uh, having this kind of small, uh, uh, transferred uh, uh, open space into a grocery shop, et cetera, and how we could connect and stitch all those fragmented uh, uh, locations here and there in order to create a more uh, uh, livable uh, neighborhoods in Gaza. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. I have another question from Zat Jamil. Thank you for this deeply moving presentation. I love how you've attended to interior spaces as a way to mitigate the effects of the occupation. I wonder if you could explain a bit more how sustainability configures in your architectural designs, especially within a landscape where the ecology has also been severely impacted. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, interesting question. Uh, in terms of sustainability, I still remember that when I started doing my research, my PhD research back in England, and 
despite the fact that I was still, still funding my, my PhD in Oxford, England, I promised my supervisor that I'm not going to mention three words, sustainability, resilience, and conflict in my research, actually. Simply translating those things into Arabic, it doesn't mean anything. So from my point of view, my people just need like a decent shelter to live in. So let us talk about the durability of materials that uh, have been used actually, because as I mentioned at one of my slides that uh, wood is very expensive actually, mud is very expensive. And also we are in lack of this kind of technical experience. So we have to bring some uh, consultants from outside to teach the local workers how to do either houses out of mud or houses out of wood. And at the end, it's not responding to the extended family system, as I have said. So the main theme over here and the main focus is how we could use this kind of durable construction material, which is cement at the, at, at the first place. And of course, we could use like hybrid materials such as rubble or some fillings here and there. And I'm investigating more and in using such alternative at specific uh, points or at specific places of my design. I, I just to tag along to that question, um, I think you, you may have alluded to this, but our question, we might question here about all the restrictions around Gaza of materials coming in and uh, wondering if construct, reconstruction is even possible with all these uh, um, constrictions. And I'm wondering, if what you're sharing now is saying that there are other methods of, of building, uh, of use of materials that to circumvent all these uh, different um, obstacles and the constraints of the siege and the closure, um, which is ingenuous and, and um, very innovative, of course, and, and shows uh, the creativity of people. Um, I don't know if, if, if there's more to add to that, or if you're seeing architects um, using new materials there. Yeah, actually, sadly speaking, it's mainly due to the complicated Gaza reconstruction mechanism. So after the 2014 attacks, uh, and recently after the 2021 attacks, still, I mean, well, this kind of complicated reconstruction mechanism. So for example, if there is a family which their house or their home is either partially or totally damaged, they have to register their names at the list of the Ministry of Public Work and Housing. Then the Ministry of Public Work and Housing is going to send uh, some site engineers in order to evaluate the, 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 the situation of each house and to set a detailed bill of quantities and then to send that list or bill of quantities to the other side, the Israelis, and then the Israelis will take like maybe a few months and sometimes more than one year to respond and to allow that X or Y family to have access to the construction materials and also asking them to go to, go to specific like material supply, suppliers where they do have like cameras fixed here and there in order to make sure that the family is utilizing that thing into construction. So the other choice is to buy construction material from the market, which is expensive and most of the families could not afford to do that. Despite all those kinds of constraints, of course, as architects and designers, we have to keep thinking and we have to keep experimenting with the new materials and with the new techniques. And I'm in touch with a couple of colleagues back in Gaza who kept experimenting and using new materials, such as mixing cement with like wooden powder, for example, to make it more lighter or making other things uh, more productive and more lighter and more, more durable as well. But the main thing that is that we have to include the families within the process of testing and experimenting those materials. Because for a community such as the Gaza Strip to accept a new material, they have to, to have a model in front of them in order to feel uh, more secured and more happy, more happy about accepting this model. And this is actually the thing that I'm trying to do with my colleagues is to set up a model in front of them, maybe to construct a model uh, like uh, uh, an experiment and also to ask the family to participate within the process of uh, building that thing. So right now my focus is mainly with this kind of minority of the widowed woman who lost their husbands because of the, the conflict. And at the beginning, I thought that it might be like a normal uh, a group, like extended families. But whenever I'm, I'm going deep, I used to hear a lot of things taking place in terms of the violence, the domestic abuse, etc., etc. So we have to be more specific and we have to keep organizing our works, focusing and to keep a focus on extended families, 
in need and those minorities of, of, of vulnerable women who are in urgent need as well in terms of housing and housing rights for them. Um, thank you. I have a question here from an architect in Gaza, uh, yes. architect Nesma al yes. And her uh, question is, thank you, Dr. Salem, for this hard touching presentation about special form of architecture in our beloved city, Gaza. I love the approach that insists on the built environment of Gaza that are available here, which emphasize on the concept that any development of Gaza architecture should start from its inherited char characteristics and the experiences of people inside the spaces of it. And any other dramatical changes in experimental building will not satisfy the real needs of people here. I love the emphasis of religious values and the focus on the most living person inside the house, the woman. That's why I believe she should uh, be the decision maker of the house. She will manage and operate. Finally, this lecture made me more sure that Gazan architects can present real solutions to their community if they get closer to the experiences of humans inside the city. Thanks a lot. I think this is probably more of a, a comment than a question, but it's wonderful uh, that architects in, in Gaza are joining us in this uh, discussion as well. Uh, Salem, yeah. if you would like to comment on this? Yeah, yeah. first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sister Nasma Ithaka for her uh, good question. And I'd like also to give more emphasis on the role of uh, the woman, the wife within the family, actually. And I used to call her, I used to call the wife, actually, the minister, the minister of finance, the minister of defense, the minister, the minister of public relations, because she's everything. And I had so many like stories uh, when I was uh, working as the shelter coordinator. One of them that I used to, to share with my students most of the time and my colleagues that one day in the morning, I had got a phone call from the contractor and uh, he told me that he had been kicked out of the houses Simply, the man had got married to two wives, and every one of them is upset that we are not going to construct a kitchen or a bathroom for each one of them. So when I called my line, ma my line manager back there in our office in Gaza, the easy thing is just to cancel that case and to replace it with with with, with another like case because we do have a long uh, long list of waited people. So that was the easiest uh, solution actually. But I did some efforts. I took some efforts and traveled from Gaza to Rafah. And they called the husband, the poor husband, actually, and the two wives to come. And I was trying to listen to them and also to explain to them the expected outcomes of the projects and the limitations on budget, because we do have a specific budget for each and every house. At the end of the day, I made some quick sketches with the help of the contractor. We managed to do like a small kitchen aid and a small bathroom here and there, and to make both of the wives happy and also to make the poor husband happy. And in, in, in addition of having one family, we concluded about adding another family, which is the second wife. So over here, my argument is that we have to be good listeners to our client and to take some efforts and to take some risk also to deal with the communities in need on the level of the everyday, uh, everyday life. And which gave this emphasis when I started dealing also with this uh, minority of the, the minority of the wounded woman, I started also hearing so many stories about this kind of violence, abuse, etc., etc. So maybe the architectural design might not solve the, the entire problem, but it could participate in solving part of it by building a wall or building a room or a kitchen or, the, or a bathroom on the top of the extended family house in order to provide more security and more safety for the wounded woman and her children. So yeah, Sister uh, Nesma, you are absolutely right. Woman is the essential part in the design process, not in Gaza actually, but everywhere else. Thank you. Yeah, I... Uh... Uh, I, I realize now that she actually did send a question. <laughs> um, her question is, how can this study and proto prototyping be generalized to be a prototype guiding the post-war housing projects taking place nowadays in Gaza? Yeah, I'm afraid that uh, we could not generalize things, even within, as you know that, within the limited space of Gaza, we do have different communities. For example, in the north, of Gaza, we do have Beit Lahi, Jabali, Beit Hanun, mainly in Beit Lahi, we do the fishermen and also the, the farmers uh, community, with, which they do have like their own 
perceptions toward design and circulation and the arrangement, arrangement even for the kitchen and the bathroom room units, for example. While in Rafah, in Shoka, Rafah, the southern part of the Gaza Strip, we do have the Bedouin communities, with it, which they do have like totally different uh, design aspirations and, and reflections on, on inner circulation, etc. So what I'm trying to do over here is just to, to set the general guidelines in terms of privacy, protection, thermal uh, insulation, etc., etc., and then we have to be careful while implementing such a house design prototype with each community. So it's not about generalizing things, rather than having some guidelines and then to adapt such a prototype for each and every community. Um, yeah, the, the, I have so many questions here. I'm trying to uh, <laughs> see how many we can cover here. So this, this is a question that touches upon uh, some of what you have worked on. Um, for the humanitarian, it's a question from Alex Miller. For the humanitarian sector for shelter, what are recommendations for intelligent and effective emergency shelter programming you could share? Thank you so much, my friend, for joining us and for sending the question. As we have discussed before, just having to have good ears and to be a good listener to the community, because with respect, Syria is totally different than Iraq, Iraq is different than Yemen, Afghanistan, each and every community it has its own unique cultural and, and habits and perceptions as well. So it's being a good listener and speaking the language of the people and not to try to, to copy design solution from one place to another, rather than being engaged with the, within the communities, speaking their own language and having um, a good ears to, to, to their real needs. Thank you, Alex. Right, so I have, we have a question here from an anonym, anonymous attendee. Is there any architectural, technological, or stylistic interchange among Gazan and Israeli rebuilding typologies? Uh, it's a, actually a good question, and I have highlighted the, the answer at uh, part of my research, actually, highlighting that mainly because of the Palestinian workers uh, who kept working inside the occupied territories, actually. And as you know, many uh, Jewish architects immigrated from Europe, mainly the Eastern part of Europe after the, the, the First and the Second World, World War, and they have brought this kind of like concrete uh, techniques with them or this kind of minimalistic uh, uh, or the so-called the new vernacular uh, architecture in the region. And of course, by having some Palestinian workers working in building the settlements and also working inside those occupied territories, this has increased uh, the, the technical knowledge of the workers who have brought this kind of knowledge and they started using it inside inside Gaza. So yeah, we have got a benefit from such things and we do have like uh, buildings with strong foundations, multi-story building, multi-residential multi -residential building, which some of them have been destroyed totally during the attacks, the recent attacks in 20, 2021 as the whole world have seen on TVs. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid we are uh, out of time for more questions, and I apologize to all of uh, you who uh, put questions. I will share them with uh, Dr. Salem, so he will have a, an idea of, of um, what you are asking. Um, this uh, webinar will be posted on our website, hopefully soon, so you can share it with others. We thank you all for joining us. And most importantly, we thank Dr. Salam al Qudwa for his work, for sharing it with us. And um, we thank uh, Dr. Sarah Roy for sharing her remarks. We are sorry that she wasn't able to join us today. Thank you all. And we hope you'll join us for another webinar in the future. Thank you. Sponsors, Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.